David Boardman. I'm the Dean of the Klein College of Media and Communication. I know we have students here both from the Klein College and from Temple's other schools and colleges, as well as many guests. So welcome to you all. Um, this day really is one of my favorites of every year as we celebrate the accomplishments of some of our most <laughs> distinguished graduates with the Lou Klein Alumni in the Media Awards. We also salute one person in the media who we believe personifies the values of excellence and integrity, the, the Klein College and the man for whom we are named, the late Lou Klein, represent. This student conversation with that person is an annual tradition. This morning's event is being brought to you through the generous sponsorship of Temple University Television and the Cal and Lucille Rudman Media Production Center. Please join me in thanking them for their support. You know, not many college students get this kind of opportunity. In fact, at a time when the role of the press has never been more important or more discussed and debated, millions of Americans would savor the opportunity to be face to face with one of the nation's most high profile journalists. You in this room get that chance and I'm counting on you to use it well with lots of great questions for our guests. Jake Tapper grew up about three miles from here in the Queen Village neighborhood of Philadelphia. After graduating from Dartmouth University, he tried out film school, then worked as press secretary for a member of Congress from Pennsylvania, then tried public relations, thought about being a novelist, and finally landed on journalism. He worked first as a print reporter, working for the Washington City Paper as a reporter, and then for Salon.com, and began, began his full-time career in broadcast news in 2003 with ABC, a job that took him to Iraq, Afghanistan, and New Orleans to cover Hurricane Katrina. He came back to the nation's capital in 2008 as ABC's senior White House correspondent and joined CNN in 2012. If you tune in to CNN these days, it's hard to miss Jake Tapper. He hosts a one-hour show called The Lead with Jake Tapper daily and another called State of the Union on Sunday mornings. He often anchors special political coverage, including moderating presidential election debates. He even draws animated cartoons for his programs. Somehow, he's found time in all of this to write four books, including a novel. Here's how a magazine profile described our honoree. With the leader of the free world now waging a self-styled war with the media, no journalist on TV has become more indignant, more combative, and suddenly more essential than Jake Tapper. That article appeared under the headline, CNN's Jake Tapper is the realest man in fake news. <laughs> Our honoree prides himself on being an equal opportunity interrogator to the extent that he actually declines to vote in order to avoid bias or appearance of bias. That approach has brought wrath from both sides of the political aisle, first when he aggressively covered the Obama White House and now with his probing questioning of Trump administration officials. He has said, quote, my job is not to be liked, my job is to tell the truth. Our guest is one of the most highly respected reporters in Washington among his peers, winning a variety of awards, including four from the White House Correspondents Association. And today, we're pleased to recognize him with one of Temple University's highest honors, the Lou Klein Excellence in the Media Award. Please join me in welcoming our guest, CNN journalist, anchor, and awesome journalistic John, Jake Tapper. Thank you. That was very nice. So I'm going to start off with a couple of questions to get us going. And while I'm doing that, we have two mics here in the front. Um, we want to give you students a chance to line up at the microphones, please, to ask yours. So you can go ahead and step up to those mics. Um, when uh, we call on you, please identify yourself by name, your year, and major, and these questions uh, are, are restricted only to Temple students. You can be from any school at Temple, but um, please, Temple students only, because this is called the student conversation. Um, so Jake, given that you're a Philadelphian, you know that the most trite and ridiculous interview question of any Philadelphian is, 
Pats or Geno's. Yeah. So instead, I'm going to ask you, D'Alessandro's or Ishka Bibble? Uh, Tony Luke's. Oh, okay, Tony Luke's. <laughs> and uh, staying with that Philly theme, what, what to do about Gabe Kapler? That's a tough one. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't fire him. I would keep him, and give, I'd give him another year. Right. That's what I'd do. I remember um, when, uh, <laughs> that's a smattering of applause. Um, <laughs> I remember when Pete Rose, I'm old enough to remember when Pete Rose first came to the Phillies, and he came in 79, and they did not win it in 79, but in 80 they did. And, um, you know, maybe the same phenomenon can take place next year with uh, you know, Bryce Harper. Um, so I, I, I would not get rid of him, I'd give him another year. All right. So now, turning back to Washington, you've been called a flunky and Jake Tapper of fake news CNN by our president one of literally hundreds of attacks on journalists by President Trump who likes to call us enemies of the people. Mm -hmm. Is this just the normal push and pull that we've seen between presidents and the press really since the days of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and certainly including President Obama? Or should we as Americans be more concerned about this? Uh, it's not the normal push and pull. I mean, presidents normally typically don't like their press coverage, uh, and presidents have gone after individual reporters and columnists, anchors, uh, and, uh, and even channels or newspapers at different times. Um, Harry Truman threatened to punch a columnist in the nose one time um, after he gave a scathing review of his daughter's singing. Uh, <laughs> President Obama uh, used, uh, his administration used the whistleblower, I'm sorry, the um, Espionage Act to go after whistleblowers and leakers to the press more than all previous presidents combined, and obviously he waged a campaign against Fox News. Um, but no, this is this is something else entirely. Uh, the invective against the media, all of the media except for the most um, obsequious, uh, is of a kind and an amount that we've never seen before, and. Um, first of all, it's dangerous. Literally, one of the president's supporters, Caesar Sayoc, sent pipe bombs to CNN and other media organizations, um, revved up by the president's rhetoric, also against some of the president's political opponents. Uh, and one might think that a rational human being, uh, after leading this campaign against the media and then having one of his supporters actually try to kill members of the media, might think, okay, you know what, I'll, maybe I need to dial it back a little. This is a big country, 330 million people. Obviously, there are people who, out there who are mentally imbalanced or whatever, and I, I need to watch what I say. That's, that's the reaction that a, that a normal person might have, and that's not been his reaction. He's actually gone further. He's now not just calling us fake news, but corrupt news. And this is going to get much worse as we begin this impeachment uh, as a proceeding, covering the impeachment proceeding. The, um, the only other thing I'd say about it is there's a very clear reason why the president does this. And according to Leslie Stahl from 60 Minutes, he admitted it to her. And that is he wants to undermine our credibility and you know, what we say, what we report so that when we report negative things about him, his supporters don't believe them. And you see that playing out today. I mean, one of the reasons why his supporters uh, are, have stuck with him, his diehard supporters have stuck with him, is not just because of their loyalty, not just because in the United States, 30% of the public is gonna support whoever's in the White House no matter what, uh, it's because they don't believe it. They don't believe the reports, even if they come from the Wall Street Journal, which is owned by Rupert Murdoch, or Fox News. If it's negative, they won't believe it because that's the campaign he's been leading rhetorically, and it's been effective to that degree. Um, during that 2016 election, uh, your network's rating soared, and that was driven uh, many people believe by the spectacle of this colorful, unpredictable Republican presidential candidate. And the network made about $100 million more than it had 
projected uh, to make. Many critics said that the network and the journalists and its journalists had been irresponsible in overcovering Donald Trump. And there was a peer-reviewed academic study that showed that CNN had mentioned Donald Trump's name eight times more frequently than any other single candidate who was in the Republican primaries. Today, those same critics say that your network seems to promote and savor this love-hate relationship that it has with Donald Trump. What does this look like from the inside as one of those journalists, and are, is there any validity to those criticisms? I, I think, the, I think the, the, the validity of the criticism lies with the fact that CNN, along with Fox News and MSNBC, ran unedited live too many Trump rallies in 2015 and early 2016. Uh, I think that, I mean, without question, Donald Trump was a phenomenon. He entered the race in, I think, uh, June or July 2015, and by August or September, he was number one in the polls. Uh, he, was, he didn't get to number one in the polls because of a month or two worth of coverage. Uh, he, he was obviously speaking to something in the Republican electorate. But Jeff Zucker, my boss, um, has said, uh, to his credit, I think, that, that CNN should not have done that, uh, should not have aired so many of those rallies as they did, as we did, um, unedited and unfact-checked. Uh, and I have not heard similar admissions from MSNBC or Fox. But I think that's a valid I think that's a valid criticism. I would say, generally speaking, in terms of the media writ large, there were too many soft interviews of Donald Trump. Uh, and I say that as somebody who I don't think I was giving soft interviews of Donald Trump. Um, but it is, it is frustrating to be one of the few people asking tough questions if other people are not, because um, that means you're less likely get, to get interviews. So the last time that I was allowed to, uh, I mean, I just the last three interviews I did with President Trump, then candidate Trump, was the February 2015 interview where he wouldn't decry or denounce the support and endorsement he got from David Duke of the Ku Klux Klan. And I asked him three times, and he wouldn't do it. Um, there was a debate, there, there was a, um, another interview I did where I basically was begging him to stop getting people at his rallies so amped up that they were hitting protesters and such. And then the very last interview I did with him was in June 2016, the interview where I pressed him on Judge Curiel, um, the uh, judge from Indiana of Mexican heritage, born in Indiana, who uh, was judging the Trump University suit. And I basically said, if you're saying he can't be fair because of his race, isn't that the definition of racism? And that was the last time I got to interview him. So I do, I do think that there were people asking him tough questions, not just me, but others but not, I don't think they were sufficiently uh, being asked. Great. Um, I'll again invite students to come to the mics. There's two mics here. Um, we're gonna alternate from one to the other. I'll ask uh, one more question here before we hand it off. Um, I, Jake, there are a lot of students in the audience who would like to do what you do. Mm -hmm. um, the future of journalism as a way to make a living certainly looks a little bit shaky these days. The, the newspaper business from which I came is certainly in crisis, especially at the local level. And there are a lot of predictions that this economic tsunami is going to uh, wash over local television soon. What would you say to the many aspiring journalists in the audience today uh, about why they might want to stick with this uh, despite these challenges? Because we need truth tellers. This nation desperately needs truth tellers. The nation cannot live without a thriving and functioning press. Can you imagine what the last two years would look like without the press? What would we not know about? Everything, it, it's, we, 
it, it, I'm getting upset thinking about it. Um, <laughs> just take the, the, the Ukraine story that we now know about the scandal. It's not the US Senate doing this oversight of the executive branch. It's the media and the House of Representatives now. And in this time when uh, politicians are showing great weakness and capacity for putting the value of their careers, their political careers, ahead of important principles in this republic, uh, and at a time when media is trusted so little by the American people, at a time when ideological journalism, whether on, on, on Fox or elsewhere, is corrupting the values of what exactly truth and fact is, we need you. We need you to rise to the moment and, and join us. It is, if you care about facts and you care about the truth and you care about speaking truth to power and comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable, then there is no better career for you, um, I, I think. And um, if you feel the sense of calling that a lot of journalists do, then you should hear it. Because at the end of the day, whether or not you like what you do is so important to your happiness going forward. Uh, I, I, you're young, so you don't know this, and there's going to be a few years that, where you have to pay dues and such. But whether or not you look forward going to work, whether or not you actually enjoy doing your job is a very important thing. And I, you know, there are so many people I know who became colleagues of uh, friends of mine from college who became lawyers because just that was the right th the thing to do. You you know you go into law and you have a comfortable life and such. And I don't they don't talk about their jobs the way I talk about mine. So Great. that's why. All right, let's start with the student questions. We'll start over here again. Your name, year, major, and then your question. Thanks. Hello, my name is Stephen Reichert. I'm a junior, and I'm a real estate major. Uh, I guess that my main question would be that given that journalism is, it's not even about unveiling injustices, it's more about unveiling the truth. How do you deal with the fact that we have a president right now and his followers that they don't want to know the truth. They don't want anything that doesn't support their side. Even calling Fox News not friendly enough to conservative views. So how do you deal with that group that doesn't want the truth, that only wants their biases reinforced? Um, I don't. I mean, my job is just to report the truth and report the facts and whoever it upsets, it's not really my problem. It's not fun So to... you, So you don't think it's the job of the media to try to rebuild trust with anyone that's... Oh, no, I do, but I, I do think it's the job of the media to rebuild trust. And I do think it's important... Uh, David mentioned how I consider myself an equal opportunity interrogator or whatever. And, and I mean, I think one of the reasons why conservatives distrust media, which is a phenomenon that preceded Trump by decades, is because uh, there is a perception, sometimes borne out by reality, that, dem that the media is not as tough on Democrats as it is on Republicans. And I think that part of the job is to be aware of that perception and make sure that we are as tough on everybody. Um, but in terms of people who don't care about law, uh, lies and people who don't seek the truth. I, I don't, there's nothing I can do except just report the facts and hope that people um, come to appreciate it one way or the other. You know, I spent eight years covering Obama and being attacked by the left as a right-wing hack and a Republican and a conservative and all this stuff. And now a lot of those same people are 
um, are not criticizing me as much or at all, and it's the other side that's doing it, and it's just like, that's the job. That's the job. Um, just to report the facts and the truth, put it in context, explain why it's significant, explain and analyze, um, and then let, chip, let the chips fall where they may. But there are always going to be people who don't care about facts, don't care about the truth, only want to hear things that reinforce their, their worldview. And that's okay, and there are channels and publications for those people. Um, but those people are not who I am reporting for. Does that make sense? Yes, thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Steve. Yes, sir. Um, my name is uh, Jefferson Schomer. I'm a sophomore journalism major. Um, my question is, you work for CNN, a uh, notoriously establishment perspective. Um, so do you ever feel any pressure to defend people like Joe Biden or Nancy Pelosi or Hillary Clinton, even when maybe you don't want to? Uh, no. Never. No? OK. <laughs> All right. No, I mean, I don't. I, and, and, um, and one of the reasons I like social media is because of uh, questions like that or attitudes like that, um, which is the, 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 if, I, if I can extrapolate, the idea that the Democratic Party uh, today, Pelosi or <clears throat> Uh, or Biden is, um, and I'm, I'm reading into your question, so if I'm wrong, I apologize, too establishment, too wedded to corporate interests, too status quo, not, uh, w not willing enough to question the existence of the whole system <clears throat> the way Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren or AOC or others would, um, would want to change things. <clears throat> and um, uh, that's one of the reasons I love Twitter. Uh, is, is to hear viewpoints like that. But no, I don't feel any sense of pressure or I don't care who wins the Democratic presidential nomination. I'm not rooting for anybody. That's up to the Democratic voters. I hope it's a fair fight. I want to ensure that, it's, that there's integrity in the process. But whether it's Bernie Sanders or Pete Buttigieg or Kamala Harris or Joe Biden, I, that's for the Democrats to decide. Uh, and I just want to cover it. And I'm not, I'm not rooting for anybody, and I'm not rooting for establishment or anything like that. I think AOC is a welcome voice in the Democratic Party. I think she's uh, shaking things up, and I think that's great. My name's uh, Kieran Frank. I'm a freshman journalism major. Hi there. Hi. Um, so my um, question is, is that CNN is... Um, been found by multiple independent research and from journalism watchdogs just to random scientists that their bias is left. As you've said, it, we, you know, you, it can happen. I, not your show, actually, because I watch your show every day. But, um, <laughs> but there are some so shows like Wolf's and Anderson's uh, that are definitely left biased. How can you f help, help them become less biased to give true, real facts, and not alternative facts. OK. Um, well, first of all, let me respectfully take issue with the premise of your question about Wolf and Anderson, who I think are fair. But let me extrapolate it out to a larger point about, about media bias. I think that there is media bias because I think that we are all human beings and we make mistakes. And I think we all view the world through the lens that we were given. Um, that bias, in my view, and I'm speaking with, this is a huge generalization, but, but that bias tends to be, uh, tends to reflect a world in which uh, people went to college. Uh, people have never worked a minimum wage job. Uh, people have never experienced poverty. People are not members of unions. People have never fired a gun. People have, you know, maybe grown up in a, in a, in a household where democratic politics, uh, where people were Democrats. Th th those are generalizations, but I think, I think in, in, uh, you can see that reflected in some people's reporting. Um, I do see it. Um, individual cases, individual people, I do think most reporters are trying to be fair and trying to do the right thing, but I do see it. But I think it's also a reflection not just of uh, the idea that maybe this journalist supports abortion rights, okay? I'm just a, a, a journalist X, 
But maybe also that journalist doesn't really cover poverty because he or she has never seen it or never grew up around it. And for that reason, we don't see a lot of coverage of income inequality in this country or poverty in this, question, in this country. So I think there are a lot of biases that, that feed into people's coverage of things. Story selection always has to do with bias. Often it's a bias for what is the most interesting thing that happened today or where is the, you know, where is the biggest conflict. Um, I will say as a general note, and again, I'll repeat that I really respect Anderson and Wolf, but I will say as a general note, it's not my job to tell other journalists how to do their jobs. I control my little island of my hour-long show. I appreciate the fact that you think it's fair. Um, and all I can try to do is, is have that as what I control and um, try to make sure that it is, is, it is as fair as possible. And that doesn't mean that like if one person comes on TV and says, the sky is blue, that I feel the need to run out and get somebody who's, who says, no, 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 the sky is red, because that's not journalism. That's, that's bullshit, is what that, you know. But, but when it comes to opinions, yes, it's important to have a, a wide range of, of debate and discussion and lots of diversity on the panelists, not just racial diversity, not just gender diversity, but also ideological diversity as well. I'm not saying I don't disagree with Wolf and Anderson. I'm actually a global person myself, so you know, and I'm willing to say that, you know, like, so I don't, I'm not anything disagreeing. I'm just saying it's, it's been known, and I have a lot of friends who are more moderate than I am that are still liberal that, you know, still say they won't watch some shows on CNN or like that, but they'll always watch yours. It's true. Yeah. I always have both sides on one side, and Democrat analysts on this side and Republican on the other. Yeah. I'll take the compliment and. <laughs> Put the other stuff aside. But thank you so much. I appreciate it. Hi, I'm Christine Choi. I'm a senior CSI major, communications and social influence major. Um, so last year we had Omarosa come by, and I recall that we you had who? We had Omarosa. Oh, okay. We had Omarosa come by, and um, how fortunate. I recall that we <laughs> never once talked about ethics, let alone uh, journalistic ethics, um, the entire time. So. I wanted to ask you, throw you a little bit of a softball. What does the word ethics mean to you, especially given your field, especially given the context of living in the era of fake news? That's a really good question. Um, I think ethics are in and integrity are essential for journalists, and it's an incredibly important part of what we do. I'm kind of a choir boy about it. I think that we in journalism need to conduct ourselves in a way that, that it, not just in our professional lives, but also in our, in our personal lives in a way that demonstrates ethics. Um, I think it's problematic when journalists who are, have sloppy personal lives then go on TV or in their newspaper and write about politicians with sloppy personal lives. Um, one example of ethics is that I would never book Amorosa on my show um, <laughs> because I don't trust a word she has to say. Uh, but I mean, I, I think that having integrity both as a person and also as a journalist uh, is incredibly important. That also means owning up to mistakes. And I think one of the problems I see in the media today is a, re is a reluctance to do so, a reluctance to own up to mistakes, a reluctance to say, you know what, I messed up that story or I, under I misunderstood that. And look, I've done it before. It sucks. It's bad when you mess something up or you get something wrong. Um, but it is important. You know, another thing that I think is about ethics is that, is that rem remembering that not every time you know something you have to report it. There have been times in the last five years where I knew somebody was sick, um, but I also respected that it, it, it wasn't an example, it, w it wasn't like somebody was sick so they couldn't do their job. Mm -hmm. That would be a story that there, there was maybe more justification for going with. But somebody is sick and it's not my place necessarily to report on that person's illness. If that person, even if it's a public figure, wants to deal with their personal illness in their way, I have respected that. I can see why people might disagree with that decision, but I have done that. So I don't know, it's just a conduct of, that allows you to sleep at night and look at yourself in the mirror. 
Does Thank that make you. sense? Is yes. That, okay. Yes. Thank you. Hello. How you doing? Uh, my name is John Taji. I'm a junior risk management major. Um, my question for you is, obviously somebody on um, national television constantly, you have to have a strong personal brand. Um, what would be your best advice for growing a personal brand? What would be my best advice for a, a personal brand? Yeah, growing your personal brand. What was the first word? The what <laughs> personal brand? Growing your personal brand. Growing my personal brand? I don't really think of what I do as being part of a personal brand. I might think about my show as having a brand, um, but I don't think of like Jake Tapper as a brand. It's, uh, it's you know, I, you know there, are, there are things I do that are important to me, um, like advocating for uh, veterans, but, but um, that's not, it's not, a, it's not a personal, it's not a part of my brand. Um, so I don't, I guess I'm, com I'm confused about the question. I don't, because I don't think of it that way. What, you can ask a follow-up if you want. Well, like, growing, being on, like, national television, it obviously takes, like, some sort of, like, getting yourself out there and getting known to a degree. Like, so being on CNN, like, they're not just going to hire anybody to be on, like, CNN. I honestly feel like I got where I am today by working really, really hard and making a lot of mistakes and trying to learn from them and trying to be a fair reporter and trying to be tough on everyone I covered, in a, but in a respectful way. Um, and that that was just the way to succeed was just to work really, really hard. I mean, and I, I don't, again, I don't think of it as a brand, but um, when I was covering the presidential campaign of 2007, 2008, um, when Obama was running, I wanted to, be, my goal was to be uh, the White House correspondent. That was the next job I wanted. I was congressional correspondent, and now I wanted to be the White House correspondent. And I knew, I mean, the, the, there were a lot of very talented people that were covering that campaign for ABC News, where I worked at the time. And I knew the only way I was gonna get that job as White House correspondent, was that if I worked so hard and was so good that, the, that they had to give it to me, that the only, if they didn't give it to me, they would look stupid. It, like, that was it. That was like, it, it, I had to be so good that like, David Weston, who was then the AB, head of ABC News, would have to say, well, I, I can't give it to anybody else because then people will think I'm ridiculous for, for, you know, and then somebody else will hire Jake. And I got the job, and that's how, that's how it worked. But it was from outworking everybody, and, uh, and, and that's it. So, I mean, I think if I was known for anything, it was just, like, for a work ethic. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Jake. My Hi. name is Jess Torres, and I'm a junior political science major. So you've been on the air for numerous years. What has been the most difficult story that you've had to cover throughout your career? Um, <clears throat> the most difficult story I've had to cover... Uh, well, I mean, school shootings are awful to cover. They're just horrible. Um, natural disasters are horrible to cover. There's just so much pain. I remember covering the uh, Oklahoma hurricanes in 2013 or 14, or, or I'm sorry, Oklahoma tornadoes. Um, I'm not going to tell the stories that I still get upset about, but, you know, Sandy Hook, Parkland was really tough. Going into Parkland, going into Broward County a week after the shootings, and do, I did a town hall with the, uh, the students of Parkland and the community of Parkland, and that was really tough just because of the pain that this community felt. Sometimes you can go to a place and you can, you can feel the pain of the community, and I, I felt it that night. In terms of like just the longest, long-term um, difficulty, uh, I wrote a book <clears throat> about a, an outpost in Afghanistan, a, a nonfiction book about an Af outpost in Afghanistan, Combat Outpost Keating. It was actually the 10-year anniversary of the Battle of Combat Outpost Keating um, on October 3rd. So was that yesterday? Maybe yesterday, yeah. And. Um, I, I just was intrigued when I heard about the battle, and then I sought more information, and then I started talking to soldiers who fought in it. Eight U.S. soldiers were killed. It was the deadliest day of 
in 2009 for the U.S. and Afghanistan. And just talking, I interviewed more than 200 people for the book, um, and talking to these people who had sacrificed so much and had been through so much and their emotions were still so raw um, and hearing their stories was very, uh, obviously the difficulty I felt was nothing compared to what they were going through, but it was just very, the, the, the confrontation of, with, with pain, other people's pain is a very taxing, emotionally exhausting part of being a journalist. Um, and it's, it's rewarding and it's important, but it's, it's very, it, takes, it takes a lot out of you because um, you feel for the people. And, and you don't, you're not, again, their pain is so much worse, but it, it, it haunts you. But that's part of what we do. And it's important that other people, the public, know about this pain, know about what's going on. Um, so. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Benita Mwangi. I am a sophomore journalism major. And my question is, how has the presidential administration's viewpoint of the legitimacy of CNN affect your reporting of current events? It has not, because I do not care. <laughs> what they think about CNN. I really don't. Um, the president and his administration uh, have attacked everybody. They have, president Trump has attacked Fox for being insufficiently obsequious to him, which is stunning. Um, uh, and I have lived in Washington now for more than 20 years. And CNN and I are going to still be there after President Trump and his administration have left, whether that's in 2021 or 2025. Um, it doesn't really matter what they think. It has made it more difficult because normally, by now, <clears throat> I would have interviewed the president maybe once or twice. I would have gotten an opportunity to. But he will not do interviews with CNN. On the other hand, I have interviewed the vice president and all sorts of cabinet secretaries and Kellyanne Conway. So with that one exception, I can do my job. And the truth is, a lot of it is just a pose. A lot of it is just President Trump attacking us because he doesn't want people to believe what we report. And he doesn't. Um, and, and, and like, and we're just a we're just a foil for like we represent media to them, not you know, uh, and but a lot of it they don't mean, a lot of it they don't believe, they don't really think CNN is fake news. If that's true, then why do they send people onto my show to do interviews, right? Why do they reach out to us? Why do they uh, provide us with information? Why do they take our calls? Because they know we're not fake news. They know we're real news and that people depend on us and people seek us out for information to find out what's going on. It's a lie. The whole thing's a crock. They don't really believe that. So. <laughs> does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank okay. you. Thanks. I mean, honestly, I could, right now, email the White House press secretary and say, do you have a second? And before this is over, she would write back. I mean, it's all just for the cameras. They don't mean it, you know? <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, this is Hanuk, junior, Temple MSP major. Do you follow news networks overseas in Asia? Um, I do not. Uh, follow news networks overseas in Asia. We CNN broadcasts <clears throat> all over the world. We have correspondents in, in all over Asia. Uh, we have CNN I. Um, in addition, I follow uh, BBC and um, Al Jazeera. Uh, so I'm we're, I'm well aware of what's going on all over the world, but there isn't a specific news network I follow. Is there one that you think I should? 
um, such as KBS, stands for Korea Broadcasting Station. Okay. That's in South Korea. Um, does your fellow worker follow um, any overseas network? I'm sure that our international desk follows all of them, uh, including KBS. Uh, I mean, and we do spend a lot of time covering the Republic of Korea and its neighbor. And um, <laughs> we, uh, we uh, you know, I've been there a couple times. Um, it's a beautiful country. The DMZ is terrifying. Um, and uh, uh, I'm sure they do. I'm sure they do. And lastly, um, lastly, how, sorry, just. <sighs> you can come back. Let me do this uh, over here and then while you, are you remembering yeah, it or? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. When you, do you realize that about 99% people in South Korea don't watch CNN? I? They don't? That they don't. I mean, I mean, maybe for English learning purposes, they might watch CNN, but it is not like they don't get CNN. I they just get the CNN that we watch here. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I did not. I did not know that. Okay. I did not know that. But um, yeah, I'm not really an expert on which countries we have more reach in to, into. I know that. You know, we care a lot about covering South Korea and North Korea, and we have correspondents that go there. I think one of our correspondents has been, Will Ripley has been to North Korea more than any other American journalist. Um, and we are, we are, care very much about the story and, and peace between the two countries someday, hopefully. Thank you. I'll, I'll try to take a look at KBS. Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jackson. Uh, I'm a junior media studies and production major. Uh, I actually work here at the Performing Arts Center as a production assistant. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned earlier that you're a fan of social media, but I just wanted to know how um, social media affects your approach to journalism now that it's so prevalent uh, and how it's some people's like first source of news. Um, and do you find it at all demoralizing that a single tweet could kind of delegitimize de the, the hard work that you and your colleagues do? Well, just to clarify, I think what I said, and if I didn't, let me say it correctly now, is I said that's one of the things I like about social media, about hearing from people challenging the status quo. <clears throat> that's not a declarative statement that social media is entirely 100% wonderful. There are a lot of horrible things about social media, awful things about social media. Twitter is a cesspool. Um, <laughs> And uh, the hatred and ignorance that come across uh, the, the Twitter feeds of people in journalism, especially women and people of color in journalism, is disgusting. Um, and yeah, social media <clears throat> can be very demoralizing um, because, you know, there was an old expression, I think falsely attributed to Winston Churchill, that a lie goes halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes. And that was before Twitter, uh, amazingly. And people can say something and it can spread like a, like a plague and it, might, and it could not be true. And there are people, not just the Russians, but Americans too, who their goal is to spread disinformation, false information, and to wage war. Um, and I was, you know, I was talking to a Republican congressman uh, earlier today, off the record, about the, what's going on in Washington right now with Ukraine, and this Republican congressman forwarded me a story that's in the Washington Post, I just tweeted it so you can read it if you want, about um, the people who are now, the Republicans who challenge Trump, disinformation about them gets spread immediately. Um, and, you know, so I think that that is disheartening, yeah. And I think it is disheartening that people don't click the link, don't read the story, think that the headline is all you need to know, um, make assumptions based on social media. I don't know. It should be a tool that is only making us smarter, but in some ways I fear it's making us dumber 
It should be a tool that allows us to understand what other people who don't think like that us or live like us believe and how they see the world. But instead, I feel like it sometimes just makes us, you know, puts us in our own bubbles even more. So it's, I guess, like anything else, it's how you use it. Um, but yeah, it can be demoralizing. I, the truth of the matter is I don't read a lot of the responses because you, you might be too young for this, but like 10 years ago, um, when blogs were like a relatively new thing, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when blogs were a relatively new thing, the comment section on a blog might be a fun and lively place where people were debating and discussing, and it was very polite. And then like within a year, it was just like a cesspool. Um, and Twitter sometimes, social media in general sometimes is like that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm Connell Smith, a senior media studies major. Hi. Um, how do you become, for someone that wants to be a reporter, how do you become a journalist that your audience can trust? Uh, how do you become a journalist the audience can trust? Well, that's, thank you. There are people who don't trust me, so I appreciate that. Um, the best advice I can give about just like journalism is, I, I found, I started in print journalism, as David mentioned, and I found that incredibly helpful uh, just because sometimes, this is such a broad generalization, so I apologize ahead of time. Sometimes people in TV who have only trained to be in TV only train to know a minute and a half worth of knowledge. Uh, whereas if you're a print reporter and you might have to write a 5,000 word essay, you might learn more. Again, I've met plenty of shallow, stupid print reporters and plenty of brilliant TV reporters. But generally speaking, how you're trained has a lot to do with how you come, up, how, how you come across a story. And um, so the, to really understand a story, to make the phone calls, to call the people that might have a different point of view from the main character in your story, to make sure you really understand it, to not rush it into print or onto TV, to give the other side a fair shot, to try to make sure that you understand that, like, that you avoid false equivalencies, but that you are fair to all sides in a story. Um, th that, and just, a, just doing that day in, day out, day in, day out, hopefully the audience will come to trust you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. We're going to uh, have time for just one more question from each mic. So th those who are not at the mic, I apologize. We're running out of time. So start over here. Hey, I'm Tristan. I'm a, a political science and journalism double major. Uh, when he was introducing you, he mentioned that you do not vote in terms of saying fair. And we live in a time where voter suppression, we saw with Stacey Abrams and the Brian Kemp election in Georgia, and also voter manipulation, which I think becomes more and more evident, me personally speaking, that Trump did have Russia interfere. How do you justify that ideology when I would argue that it's never been more important to vote as a American citizen? It is a very fair question. Let me um, clarify. I don't vote in races I cover. So I do, like I don't cover Washington DC city council races. So I vote there, I vote in mayor's races. Um, and um, the truth of the matter is Washington DC is a very democratic city. The three electoral votes in Washington DC always go to the democratic presidential nomin uh, nominee. So. It's easy for me to say, it's easy for me to do this because it doesn't really actually affect anything. Maybe uh, it would be a tougher decision for me if I lived in Virginia, which is a battleground state. But that said, let me tell you why I reached this decision. I voted in 2000 in the Al Gore versus George W. Bush race. I voted absentee ballot, so I voted before the election. And I felt tainted. I felt like I was now rooting for one of these people. And I didn't like how that made me feel. Um, and so I haven't voted for president since then. And you know what? There are a lot of people in journalism who, who agree with you and disagree with me. And I'm not saying that that is how everyone should do it or that is the way for journalists to live. People should do what they want to do. I'm just saying for me personally, I didn't like feeling like I was rooting for somebody because I had invested in them with a vote. Mm -hmm. And that's how I felt 19 years ago. And I am not going to vote for president in November 2020. 
Again, whoever the Democratic nominee is will get the three electoral votes from Washington, D.C., so it doesn't matter. But uh, that's just how I feel. And, you know, I totally respect where you're coming from. I just, that, that's, it's a personal decision. I respect where Okay, last question Thank here. Um, my name is Hafiza. I am a second year communication and social influence major. And my question is, um, sometimes journalists find themselves challenged with the issue of sacrificing integrity for success in attempt to please everyone, whether it be monetary, not to offend anybody with the truth, or social capital. Do you have any tips on how to combat that? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. I, you know, I, I think the thing is, Ted Koppel, when I worked at ABC News, Ted Koppel once uh, took me to lunch because <clears throat> he wanted to tell me something. And what he wanted to tell me was, when the executives ask you to do things, you can say no. And I've always remembered that. And um, I think it's important to have a good relationship with your boss so that you can tell them no, so that you can tell them that you feel uncomfortable about something, that you tell them I don't want to do this, or <clears throat> let me explain where I'm coming from. <clears throat> and it's also important to do these things in a way that allows, if you're gonna keep your job and you want to preserve your integrity, it doesn't mean that every time you make a decision or you talk to your boss about, like, I don't feel comfortable doing this, that you have to make it a public thing. Sometimes you can just set the example by reporting the way you want to report, by being the kind of professional you want to be, but not bad-mouthing the place you work or bad-mouthing your boss or bad-mouthing um, mm -hmm. where you want to go. Now, with a specific story. I don't think that that is selling out. I think as long as you are doing what you want to do and, and making it clear to your boss how you want to be and preserving that integrity, that you don't have to, that, but, I don't, but some people might think that. Some people might think you're selling out by not going on Twitter and bad-mouthing your place of employment, whether it's ABC News or wherever. And that's the only compromise that I think I've ever made, is like, I, I, I feel as a journalist, I'm here to report the news. I'm here to say the facts, but I'm not here to make myself the story. So uh, that is, that, that's where I come down on, on some of these things. Okay. Does that make sense at yeah, all? Yeah, it does. <laughs> Thank you. I can't really think of an example of anything that I've had to do recently that I felt uncomfortable with. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of when, like, when we have, like on election nights, those mega panels of like 3,000 people and I'm like standing in the middle and you know, whatever, but not being a fan of something is not the same thing as taking a moral stand on something, right? You're talking about a moral stand. Yes, because, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I find it as if it's like, because, um, People have to eat, you know, people have to like live, they right. need to sustain themselves. So sometimes they find themselves in a crossroad between, do I do this thing knowing that it's not aligned with my morals and it could be potentially dangerous for the sake of getting that success or well, like, do I give, like give say me an, no? Give me an example. I mean, it's like life is full of questions like that no matter what business you go into. Mm -hmm. But I'm totally interested in hearing what, what example you're talking about. Um, if you have a hypothetical. I guess for myself, based on like the work I've done, it's like, do you, hmm. cause I find as if like, just like monetary systems and everything like that within this country, that's a whole other thing. But um, doing work, I guess, and then knowing that this work might be rooted in something Immoral. Like what? I don't know. Like, for example, maybe like someone knows that they don't like, I don't know, animal testing, for example. Mm -hmm. But they take a sponsorship 
with a beauty company knowing that they test on animals, but they still get the money for it because they need to sustain themselves, things like that. So sometimes people find it hard to maybe say no, even though like it's wrong in a lot of people's eyes. Yeah. Um, there tends to be a firewall between the people who sell commercials and the people who do the news. I don't know what ads are running during my show. I don't, even, I don't even get them on return. When we take a break, it's just a black screen there. I don't see what there is. So I don't even know what that is. So when Bernie Sanders attacked me uh, during the debate a few months ago because we were running health insurance ads, um, I, I had already told him in an interview, like, like before an interview a few days before, like, I really have no idea what ads are running. And like, there literally is no, Insurance companies suck. I mean, I don't, I, don't have any, I don't have any problem saying that. I mean, like, you know, their business is hoping that more people pay them money than will take out money for their health insurance. I mean, that's the, that's the model. Um, but people are going to see, now we're on a different subject, people are going to see a compromise in the fact that we run insurance ads. In any case, um, look, you should never do anything that you have a moral problem with, period. But what you also have to decide is what is a moral problem or an ethical problem and what is just something that like, you're not a fan of. Mm -hmm. um, like not everything you do in life and not everything you do as a journalist is gonna be the best experience in the world. Um, there are gonna be stories that you think are stupid, assignments you get that are dumb, uh, assignment editors that like don't appreciate how brilliant you are, et cetera. That's just gonna happen. Um, the question is, and by the way, when I was trying to break onto ABC News, there's a whole cache of stories that like were idiotic uh, that I did for, more, for Good Morning America that I'm not proud of. Um, but, you know, they weren't like immoral. They were just dumb. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and like, so you're going to have to make decisions, especially as you work your way up. You know, I'm in a position now at age 50 where I have a lot of control over what my show airs and uh, complete control over what comes out of my mouth. But I had to work my way to that position. And there were stories I had to do and assignments I got that were not fun and not interesting and not cool and some were hokey, especially if you ever work in morning television. But, but um, you're just gonna have to decide for yourself what's, what is a compromise of your integrity that you're not willing to make. And then draw that line and do not cross it. Thank you for thank your you. thoughtful question. And, <laughs> and, and in fact, thank all of our students. You've really done us proud with your question. And please join me in thanking our guest for his thoughtful answers. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.